Welcome back, folks. It's 29 and a half minutes past 6 o'clock, and we're joined on set by the leader of the Movement for Social Justice, Mr. David Abdullah, for a discussion on some of the latest political developments in Trinidad and Tobago, and I tell you that there are many. Welcome to Morning Edition. Great to have you here. Thanks, Ed. Good morning to all of your people tuned in to Morning Edition this morning. You know, let's talk about state enterprises. I yes. mean, this morning we, we started with the whole question of Cal and the revelations of, um, of the, the Joint Select Committee and so on. Our state enterprise sector, because it really is a sector all and all by itself, our state enterprise sector performs very important um, functions, and of course, it provides very important inputs to the general economy. Now, should all of our state enterprises aim for some level of profitability, those that are in fact revenue earning, they are direct earners of revenue, should they be positioned, should they have the necessary um, mandate to be profitable? Yes, I mean, you, you, you constrain the question by saying that those that are essentially revenue, revenue earners. Mm -hmm. yes. So we're not now talking about um, the public utilities, PTSC and so on. Would we have, in other words, would we, we have a problem if First Citizens were, were, were not profitable? Yes, we would. Good. Yeah, because you can't have a bank that is not profitable. I mean, something is obviously, it's like a credit union. Credit unions have to generate surpluses. Exactly, so for reinvestment. That's right. What about Petrotrin? Should Petrotrin be profitable? Yes, and Petrotrin ought to be profitable at this point in time, had it not been for some very bad decisions made, um, you know, 10, 12 years ago, which have put Petrotrin in significant debt. Um, the gas to liquids, the US, the ultra low sulfur diesel plant, which um, was completed and can't be started up, it has to be completely redone because the engineering was not right. It didn't take into consideration that we're in an earthquake zone. <laughs> and so we have to spend another three, 400 million US dollars after spending five, 600 million US. So bad, bad decisions have caused Petrotrin to, to be in the position that it is in now. But yes, Petrotrin ought to be profitable. Um, NGC is highly profitable. Last government raided $16 billion or something like that out of, out of NGC surpluses to help to finance the budget deficit, which was not a, not a good decision. Um, and there are a number of others. I certainly think Cal is um, one that should be close to profitability. I'm not an expert in the airline business, but the airline business does suffer from um, fluctuating fuel prices and some other challenges and so on. Cal was profitable up to 2010. They had in fact generated a surplus, I think, of a billion US dollars. And they moved from a position of a surplus of a billion US dollars in 2010. By 2015, they were in deficit by a billion US dollars. So something went badly wrong in that, in that five year period. Um, so yes, those kinds of enterprises ought to be. There are some state enterprises that I think um, ought not to exist like the education facilities company and some of the special purpose state enterprises which were set up essentially to get around the public procurement requirements and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we need to reprofessionalize the public service. So those persons who are professionals, who are knowledgeable, should be in the public service, properly paid within the public service because each ministry now under the public procurement legislation will be doing its own procurement, not the central tenders board. And didn't the cabinet set up a committee to review these state enterprises? What has become of that work? <laughs> yes, um, that committee comprised, was chaired by, by Dr. Terry Farrell, Terence Farrell, and there were a number of members, I think um, Ronald Ramkisun was on it, um, Alison Lewis, I'm not sure. There were about four or five people on it. I was not with, a number of members of the Economic Development Advisory Board were on it. I was not a member of the committee. It did report um, within a year, I think, of its being set up with, which with before a year had expired. That report has never been made public. Um, it ought to be re laid in Parliament. And I'm not aware as to whether there has been any implementation of any of the recommendations. My sense, informal sense of it, was that um, very little of what was recommended was, was agreed upon. You had, for example, the, um, the, the other media company that, that's state-owned, Helen Drayton, as then chair of CNMG, of that, CNMG yes. did, uh, had a study done, a strategic plan mm -hmm. and so on, which included looking at GISL and, and the government information services and so on. Right. And they, they did a very good report in my view. Um, 
And, but I, again, I don't think that the recommendations were implemented in the way in which, um, or some things have been implemented, but I don't think that what has been implemented was in fact what that plan came up with. Now you see, that, that's the challenge that we face. I mean, if we are, if we are making very objective assessments of the performances of these various enterprises, and then we're, we're not pursuing the, the, the recommendations being made by these committees, then we're really not making much headway in terms of generating more efficiency, a greater level of effectiveness at a time when it's greatly needed. You see, if, if we have yeah. the largest of, from the energy sector, then we certainly do have room to play. But ultimately, when you are in this situation, you have to have enterprises that are very keen on supporting new growth in the economy. And yes. if that is not happening, yes. then, then we, we're in trouble. Yes, agreed. And, and so one of the problems, root problems of our country is governance. It is how decisions get made. And it's not only in relation to the state enterprises, it's, it's generally, um, which is why, for example, we in the MSA talk about the Second Republic, because we think the institutions of state, and as set out in the Republican Constitution of 1976, that those institutions are not working well. Um, even our new president, I see her on the front page of, of the Express this morning. Well, she's trying to do damage control now in terms of the, 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 the police, police service police commission. Serve, right, and, and look at what happened. She had to make a very quick decision. Yeah. And the, parliament, the House of Representatives had to be called out bef because Friday is a normal sitting, but this Friday is Good Friday, in order to appoint this person um, to chair the police service commission in order that we could have an acting commission, not a not commissioner, you know, an acting, acting commission of yeah, police and, and yes. acting deputies yes. after Saturday when the term of office expires. Yes. You know, so all of, I mean, how can we be dealing with crime and violence and so on when you, you know, uh, uh, the institution's just not, just not working? Um, and, and so in terms of decision making, <coughs> excuse me, one of the <coughs> excuse me one of the recommendations that we made last year as a, i was a member of the petrotrain review committee mm -hmm. and one of the recommendations we made with respect to petrotrain because we only made two basic recommendations was that the board of governors sorry board of 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 petrotrain be appointed in a way that was at arm's length from the politicians in other words it shouldn't be cabinet making the decision that Hayden should sit as chairman of the board and David should be a member of the board, but that there should be a process of engaging stakeholders so that if the people in the energy sector, people in finance and so on said, yes, Hayden would be an excellent choice, then put Hayden. But it shouldn't be that Hayden is close to somebody in the party in power and therefore Hayden gets appointed as chairman. Why not have a bipartisan committee um, formed in Parliament that can vet these appointments and that in, in that regard, what we have is a greater level of transparency. It's not just a note coming to Cabinet say, well, these are the proposed members and Cabinet saying yay or nay, yes. without any significant level of due diligence being conducted, et cetera, et cetera. That let the Parliament, through a joint select committee, approve these uh, appointments, vet these appointments, ask the pertinent questions, yes. and interrogate the, the potential appointees. That, that would be useful. Of course, we have to do it in a timely way. Yes. And you see, one of the problems is that the parliament itself is part-time. So that I was a member of a joint select committee when I was in the Senate for two years, uh, in having some oversight. And there are many more joint select committees now than, than back then because the parliamentary rules were changed. But um, the, those joint select committees only meet occasionally. So mm -hmm. to deal with 80 state enterprises and mm -hmm. to vet um, hundreds of recommendations and interrogate people will mm -hmm. take ages. You may have to limit it maybe to the vetting the chairpersons of those state boards. Maybe. Or, or do it in a way un until we get um, full-time parliamentarians. But let's start there. Let's start there. Let's start somewhere to yes. demonstrate our willingness to really improve the quality of governance. All right, yes. let me ask and, you. And just very quickly, one other recommendation mm -hmm. that we have had mm -hmm. is that um, persons should be drawn from a pool nominated by civil society. So you need a, a, a 100 lawyers or 80 lawyers to, to serve on 80 boards. Let the law association nominate 80 of its members. Mm -hmm. um, you need some people from labor, let the trade unions nominate 80 persons and so on. The business sector, the, the chartered accountants yes. and so on. Yes. So they become now the pool of persons who are willing to serve nominated by yes. recognized organizations yes. rather than 
um, saying, well, I know this one, right. as I heard in a conversation right. that I was privy to when boards have been appointed, when, when I was a, a, a senator and so on. Yeah. Who is that person? We don't know that person. Do we don't, don't we have one a week to be, to yeah. be on that board? Yeah, I yeah. understand. I yeah. understand the, the dynamics of, of these appointments and, of course, how, how it flows. But, you know, here's the other thing. When we are, we are faced with uh, parliamentarians, um, in the case of um, uh, Mr. Edmund Dillon, the National Security yes. Minister, who may have this civil matter um, in another jurisdiction, um, in spite of how it appears, uh, the optics of it uh, are not very encouraging from his point of view. But the point is, as a representative of the people, when you are faced with these matters, is it, a, it should it not be a requirement that you step aside, allow the court matter to proceed, let the court make a determination, and then should you be uh, uh, exonerated, uh, then you return to your substantive post. Shouldn't that be uh, a, a, a precedent set such that all of our parliamentarians adhere to these so-called unwritten rules yes. of good governance? Yes, I suppose it depends on what the matter is. In other words, if it is a relatively minor matter of, of an allegation has been made against you, you're not guilty, then it may not be necessary for you to step aside. Um, I, I did make a statement, in fact, I drafted a statement on Friday mm -hmm. saying that he needed to give full disclosure. Mm -hmm. But as I was drafting it, I picked up um, that he was having a media conference. So I had to wait to see what he said. Right. Because reading the initial reports um, that were out in the media and, and hearing Mark Bassan's report on the Thursday evening um, TV6 News, it, what was being reported in the country was the not his side of the story. Right. It was only one side of the story, and you, you always need to get both sides at least before you could come to some conclusion. And then the third side. And then the third side is the truth, <laughs> right? Um, and Minister Dillon's initial statement, I thought, was not sufficient because he didn't give full disclosure, mm -hmm. and because he didn't indicate what his defense was, what the facts from his standpoint were. Right, right. And so yesterday I issued a statement saying that he needed to have full disclosure. Yeah. Now, um, apparently sometime after I issued that statement, a more detailed response came from him, from his lawyer, and yes, so on. That should did. have been that should have been the first thing that came out on on Friday, right? By Minister Dillon, you have to give full disclosure. Yeah, um, you can't pretend that this thing doesn't exist and it's just a private matter. Because particularly in the case of, of Minister Dillon, he's Minister of National Security, he has to interface as he did last week mm -hmm. with senior representatives of other governments yes. on national security matters. Yes. And while they would not refuse to meet with him because they can't, they will feel under some, you know, they will view it with a bit of concern that they're meeting with Hayden when it's Hayden- There's a, a level of skepticism. Yes, Hayden is now in my jurisdiction yeah. facing matters that raise questions about his- Albeit a civil matter. Albeit a civil matter. But, so but, these, but these practices, don't exist. I mean, we always yes. tout the fact that we are still operating within the context of this Westminster yes. uh, system, a system of honor. Yes, um, but there's no honor in but, but, <laughs> but, but we are not <laughs> abiding by, by this system of yes. honor Correct. in yes. terms of how we, in terms yes. of how we govern. And, and in this situation, then, it's, uh, the Prime Minister needs to make a statement. Yeah. He needs to, to, to say to the country, um, ye or nay, you know, in the context of ministers not mm -hmm. having the, 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 um, the wherewithal within themselves to, to, to step down on, on their own. And I suppose, I mean, it's easy to make comparisons um, regarding uh, the former energy minister, Eric Williams, and his, his, his uh, circumstances, and uh, even um, the, the chairman of the, of the PNM party Khan, right now, Mr. Yeah. Franklin Khan, yes. and his circumstances, and how at that time Mr. Manning would have dealt with the situation. Yes, well, they actually, were, they actually were facing charges before the courts here mm -hmm. um, so that was a, a and it was it was a criminal charge yes. and and so there was really well they did the right thing either the, on the request of the prime minister or on their own volition and one doesn't know i'm not sure but um yes they they, they were moved aside um, similarly there were issues surrounding like the former attorney general when he resigned when allegations were made about um, interference in the in terms of the justice uh, matter with respect to mm -hmm. the, the case that Mr. Dr. Rowley had and Mr. West yes. made a statement and yes. so on. So there have been precedents set and I think in this situation while it is a civil matter it does have 
implications because depending on the outcome of the civil matter, there could then be a possible criminal prosecution. Right. Um, and we don't know. So whether the statement is that they're waiting until the civil matter is determined, and if yes. it goes against Minister Dillon, then certainly I think he can't continue. I suppose, and those are the issues that we're talking about in terms of the interest of good governance. We're, yes. we're going to take a quick break, uh, yes. David, and when we come back, we're going to continue this discussion about what is happening in the politics of Trinidad and Tobago. We'll be back. Looking for structural steel beams? Then visit Point Fortin Hardware at their conveniently located showroom and warehouse in Frederick Settlement, Carony. The largest suppliers of structural steel beams and steel rods, both MS and HD, and all other building and construction supplies. For a steal of a deal, call us at 678-0857 or 374-2479. Their faith challenged an empire. There must be a handwritten account of your acts. What do you really know about these Christians? Their message changed the world. Love is the only way. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Paul, Apostle of Christ. Begin imagining with Value Optical and the start of the voyage of discovery with eyewear beyond your dreams. See the beauty beyond through lenses that transition you into the supernova of tomorrow. Open your eyes today and see your wonderland. Save up to 25% on wondrous eyewear style and technology. Visit us in-store or online for details. Value Optical, caring for your eyes. Welcome back, folks. It's 12 minutes past uh, uh, before 7 o'clock. And um, we're having this conversation with Mr. David Abdullah, leader of the movement for social justice. We're talking about governance in Trinidad and Tobago, how we're going to move forward. And ultimately, you know, Mr. Abdullah, is constitutional reform critical at this stage in our evolution as a nation? Or is it just the, the talk of intellectuals who believe that somehow constitutional reform will give us a greater level of transparency, accountability, and ultimately better governance? No, we definitely need constitutional reform. I mean, I'm, right now I'm a member, for example, of a committee appointed by the Law Association to um, perhaps make recommendations to amend the constitution and the law and the processes for the appointment of judges. And of course, this arose out of the thing that had happened last year that yes. I don't need to go into. But even so the office of the president, I mean, this is, yes. this is a timely moment for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago to consider the role of the office of the president in our Republican constitution and whether or not the president is merely just, as we say, a rubber stamp. Well, yeah, and, and some commentators have incorrectly talk, said that it's purely a rubber stamp um, office, but it isn't because without a president, we could not have a police service commission functioning That's and right. so on. Um, so the president makes appointments in her now own judgment after consultation with the prime minister but and uh, leader of opposition but not necessarily taking their views yes. to, 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 to implement their views yes. so for example the chief justice is appointed by the president 
not by anybody else, yes. not on the instructions of anybody else. Yes. Um, and the Chief Justice, of course, chairs the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, yes. and, and so on. And the President appoints the other members of the GLSC. And the GLSC then makes decisions about who are our judges. So the President does have an important role um, in terms of those kinds of institutional arrangements that we have. But yes, we do need constitutional reform. Um, we talked about the Parliament, for example. If we want to have more robust checking on the executive power um, of cabinet and of people in state boards, then you need a parliament that is full-time. So you need more senators. You need to have members of parliament who are not burdened with ministerial office so that they can spend time interrogating. Because if I just, and I, th I think one of the callers was raising this, after the GSC interrogates and makes statements, yes. what happens? And, and these Zero. revelations come to the fore what, what, what happens in, in terms of you know, the possible, rec even the recommendations being made by the GSC? Yeah, um, I mean, take for example, the collapse of the Sea Bridge. Mm -hmm. There was a G G GSC into that. Yes. Um, and that was what, six months ago? Yes. What has happened? Well, all Zero. Is, we, 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 we've had uh, resignations and, and firings. Um, but, but, but nothing but has happened in terms of resolving the problem. In terms of resolving the problem, that's, that's the key. Right. But is any state enterprise under ob any obligation to accept the recommendations of a GSC? In fact, no. is any state enterprise, anyone um, summoned to a GSC meeting, are they under any obligation to, to, to attend? Yes, they'll be under obligation to attend, but they're not under any obligation to implement the recommendations because you see, these uh, state enterprises are um, corp corporations registered under the Companies Act. Under the Companies Act, the people who have responsibility for whatever happens are members of the board. So if the GSC recommends that you go and jump in the sea and you do that, and then as a result of that, um, everything falls down. Ultimately, the GSC can't be held responsible for everything falling down, because you as a member of the board will be legally culpable for that. So, and, and there was this famous statement before the Off Commission of Inquiry by Carla Hart, saying that he really doesn't even have to account to the line minister. He only has to account to, to the board. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the law, that is probably a correct position. Um, so we need to work out those governance arrangements mm -hmm. properly, which requires constitutional reform. And, and there's so many other aspects of, of our functioning. Um, the Integrity Commission, for example, is, is it able to, to, to um, fulfill its mandate? The Financial Intelligence Unit makes reports to the Parliament every year of hundreds of suspicious transactions totaling billions of dollars. What happens? In terms of prosecution? Almost zero. What about the Auditor General's department? Understaffed and so on. Look, look at, for example, the Director of Public Administration and the CPO's office. Um, they can't manage all of the responsibilities um, for hiring. The, CP the DPA's office has responsibility for hiring and promotions um, under the, all the service commissions. Um, prison, you know, um, teaching, public service, all of those. You're talking about tens of thousands of people and one office understaffed can't deal with all of that. So we clearly but need but major you reform. See, this is, the, this is the thing, Mr. Abdullah. We have known this for, for a, a long period time. of time. Yes. But yet we have not moved in any decisive way to correct any of this. That has to be deliberate. R yes. And well, there's several things. One is that um, governments, when they get in, see these things, some of the institutions, as obstacles to what they want to do. And so they go at it in a way that does not yield end results, outcomes that are positive. Um, or they try to set up parallel organizations like the special purpose companies and so on, like the government is now doing with the revenue authority. So they get around BIR and customs by setting up a parallel organization. But um, what we need to do is to engage in a process of reform that does not necessarily get around the problem, but addresses what the, the core cause. issue. That's but, right. But but the political will for that to happen does not exist. Does not now exist. Nor do the skills of our leaders um, enable them to engage that process properly. But even so, is is the population, the voting public, are they aware of the importance of this level of? Uh, 
restructuring that's required to ensure that we have the adequate checks and balances in place, to ensure that we have good governance and transparency in all that is being done. Um, is this a critical issue for the bo voting public at all? Yes, which is why we have been changing governments um, consistently from 1981. So w Dr. Williams died in 81, you had a new prime minister, uh, Mr. Chambers. He went out after five years, Mr. Robinson and the NER. He went out after five years, Mr. Manning, uh, with a quote unquote new PNM came back in and so on. Then, then he lost the election and Mr. Pandey came in in alliance with Mr. Robinson. Then they won an election, then they had internal problems and they went out. Mr. Manning came back in and had one and a half terms and then Mrs. Prasad the Cecil, then she went out and Dr. Rowley and so on. So we've been changing governments or changing prime ministers very consistently almost every five years from 1981 to now. And to me, all you're saying to me is that we've, we've been oscillating between BIM and BAM um, in search of something that is new and different, in search of this much coveted change. That's right, which is why I like um, Helen Francis, the Calypso monarch of, of, of this year, we have to change the change. Change the change. And, we, and we've been talking about a, a lot of change um, during the course of these election campaigns. But, but not the getting delivery. real change. We're not getting real change. Yes. Uh, to use Mr. Pandey's phrase, we're getting um, exchange. And then the only recourse that we have as the voting public is to wait for another five years to, to decisively yeah. act on, the, on these matters. And, and that is why we, we need to move in a completely new direction. Because you see, I think the culture of both the PNM and the UNC, um, they don't have a culture of challenging the status quo, um, whether in terms of economic policy. So how are you going to challenge those who um, are benefiting from the economic resources of the country, which are still substantial? But part of the problem is that the rich will be getting obscenely rich in this country. And large numbers of people, a quarter of the population is under the poverty line. Another 25, 30% just making it from payday to payday. Um, and there are others who really don't know what to do with, with all the money they're getting. I mean, I look at the GHL matter. Is it, do, do you think that people just don't understand the critical importance of constitutional reform simply because they can't relate it to their day-to-day -day life? So for instance, you were yes. talking about um, income inequality and the widening gap of income inequality. Do people, can, if people can relate that back to campaign finance reform, Yes. And ensuring that at the end of the day, there is equity in terms of how the government um, contracts out work uh, to various entities and so on, um, and how they benefit, who benefits and so on. Do you think that if, if, if the conversation links those critical issues and shows how uh, constitutional reform will impact on reducing income inequality, do you think then the voting public will be more astute in how they cast their vote. Yes, I, th I, I agree with that. And, and not only in terms of economic policies, which would redress the, ine the inequality in the country, but also, for example, how the problems that you have of roads, breaking down of bridges and so on, schools that are collapsing, a healthcare sector, community set facilities that don't exist. How do we ensure that resources get allocated to communities fairly and equitably? Um, that has to do now with reform of local government and constitutional reform so that built into budgeting would be allocations to, to local communities and areas on the basis of actual needs and then allowing those communities to, to um, be involved in economic activity through cooperatives, through small businesses to do the work in those areas so the wealth remains there because you could then, how we have it is that a few big contractors get all the jobs so that, yes, roads get paved and bridges get fixed, but at the end of the day, the people in the community just get a job for a few days and the big contractors go home with hundreds of There's no of circulation of that income across communities and, and people are just simply left unempowered and the most that you can offer is your labor. That's right, and, and, and labor at low rates of pay. Who is going to lead this conversation? Well, we, we have been starting it as MSJ. We talk about the social economy shifting uh, to have a differently constructed economy. Um, we've been talking about constitutional reform, the Second Republic, and of course, we have initiated a broader process called citizens intervention, um, which is going to restart very shortly. Well, hopefully that was an important seed that will take us forward. Thank you so much, Mr. David Abdullah. Thanks a lot. Thank you for being here. Change the change. That's what we're about. Well, we're going to go to the news. When we come back, we have a lot more on our agenda. Don't go anywhere to Nantebago. We'll be back. <laughs>